This is the Inspiration Place Podcast 2020 Rewind with highlights from the best interviews of the year. Today's episode is sponsored by the Inspiration Place Holiday Goodie Bag. Go pick up your party favor over at shulmanart.com forward slash freebies. Whether you're a passionista or a passion professional, I've got something over there just for you. It's the Inspiration Place podcast with artist Miriam Shulman. Welcome to the Inspiration Place podcast, an art world inside a podcast for artists by an artist, where each week we go behind the scenes to uncover the perspiration and inspiration behind the art. And now, your host, Miriam Shulman. Well, hey there, this is Miriam Shulman, Chief Inspiration Officer and host of the Inspiration Place podcast where I help passionistas, passion makers, and passion professionals reconnect with their creativity and profit from their passion. You're listening to episode number 121. I'm so glad that you're here. As we wrap up this year, I have so much to be grateful for, especially to you, my listeners. And I want to give shout outs to some of my newest. I now have listeners in Sweden, France, Macedonia, and Portugal. Thank you so much for listening. So this is part two of our best of roundup from 2020. I've gathered up the highlights from all of our favorite moments of the interviews of this year. It was definitely hard to narrow it down. So you'll find most of the episodes from the year included here. Now, if you missed a show or perhaps you're inspired to go listen to one again, go hop on over to the show notes, which you can find over at shulmanart.com forward slash 121. We've listed out all the links to the complete episodes in the order that they're featured in the show. Now, if you're new around here and you don't want to miss future ones, make sure you hit the subscribe or follow button in your podcast app. And if you've been around for a while and you're feeling the holiday spirit, do you know what I would love? I would love a review. (laughs) And I've made it so much easier for you to gift me with one. Just pop on over to ratethispodcast.com forward slash inspire. By the way, if you pop your Instagram handle at the end of the review, I'll even give you a shout out over on my IG stories. Choose a word for the year with Kim Raluna. When I first started coaching other artists, I thought, oh, I'm just going to be all about strategy. I'm not a life coach. I'm a strategist. And it doesn't really work that way because the emotions get in the way. You really do have to talk about, don't you think? You really have to talk about yeah. mindset with them. Yes, you have to work on mindset and, and even just stuff that's going on in their personal life. Personal life affects a business, especially if you are an artist or a creative musician, like anyone that's creating content. I mean, even myself, I'm just kind of a content creator, you know, for posts and training materials and stuff. If you're someone who's creating, you have to have a good flow. Yeah. And your business flow is one thing, but the personal life affects the business flow. Having these words and spending time journaling and using a word to kind of remind yourself of like where you want to be at the end of the year. Like I know that word conviction is like, I want it to feel like when someone sees one of my posts Mm. that they're like, camera has conviction behind this. That's great. Right. And the same thing goes with art. Like what do you want people to feel when they see this? So my word actually for this year is evolve. It's interesting because what you're talking about, that you're evolving actually is a lot as a person. Mm -hmm. So I decided that was my word this year that I really am feeling right now that my whole purpose in life, that really what my conviction is that everyone's purpose in life is to evolve to that next best version of ourselves, whatever Mm -hmm. form that's going to take. I do a lot of asking myself questions. I have a huge document on my computer that is just journal prompts. Love that. To dive into myself because this is just a journey, right? I was working on a forgiveness thing inside of a different program that I'm in. And I was just like, you know what? I have forgiven this person, but I don't think I have so much this person. And then I would ask myself, why am I holding on to that thing? I literally just coach myself. I'm one of those people where it's like, I like having a coach, but I find I actually get more out of coaching myself Mm -hmm. in a journal and working with a coach for the most part. 
it's really one of those things where it's like getting good at asking yourself questions. It's a skill set that takes time to get good at. But when I first kind of started my personal development journey, I really couldn't afford like therapy, I couldn't afford coaches and things. And, you know, I was like broken on welfare back then. (laughs) So utilizing the journal was the way that kind of kept me on track, it facilitated healing for me, it, it helped me be able to figure out what I even wanted in life. Because sometimes I'm not even clear on that. I'm like, wait, what do I really want? Tapping for creative confidence with Jean Monterostelli. There's four reasons why we don't take action. We don't know what we want. We don't know how to do it. It is painful to take action and it's painful to be successful. Now, with all four of those, there's a practical component and there is an emotional component. So practical component. Some people don't know how to write a goal. Some people don't know how to state a preference. They're not doing something because practically they don't know how to do it. Emotionally, I could have had a goal in the past that I really invested in and it blew up in my face. So in a subconscious emotional way, I am preventing myself from creating a goal because I don't want to deal with the heartache of failure again. And I deal with this so much, but on a different, I just have more specifics. So with the the artists who I coach to sell art, either, like you said, either they're lacking the practical information on Mm -hmm. how to sell the thing. Yep. But more times than not, I tell them exactly what to do. And they're still not doing it because those emotions are getting in the way. Yeah, 100%. Which is why I invited you here. Like, that's why we spend so much time on this podcast talking about managing your mind, because it doesn't really help them just to give them that practical information if they can't act on it. Right. And what's really interesting, so in those four things that I gave, the third one, it's painful to take action. The fourth one, it's painful to be successful. I have a group of people who appreciate the work that I'm creating, but the instant it gets really, really big, there are more eyes prying, which means there's more judgment, which means there's going to be more struggle that comes along with that. Yeah, because you make yourself more vulnerable when you're seen. Yep. So there's this fear of success equals visibility and lots of people who have had, it has nothing to do with their creative process the work that they're doing now, but there were times in their past where they were visible and it was dangerous. And so therefore we equate all visibility with danger, but oftentimes like one of the reasons why the things that happened to us in our childhood are so traumatic is because we have so little agency. We are in a circumstance where the adults around us are dictating what we want. So even if we have preferences, we don't have agency and we don't have control. Therefore, we learn the ways that the world can harm us because of the things that we can't control and do anything about. We run into trouble when our seven-year-old self is running our business. Recipe for Press with Amy Flory. What I find very frustrating was when somebody wants to be on the podcast and I don't know how they would fit on the podcast and they want me to do that work. Right. Right. Make it easy for me to have you on by telling me what we can talk about. Exactly. Because I'm looking for content. I'm looking for ideas. I have 52 slots a year to fill because I really right. am committed See? every week. Okay. So if I approached you and I said, you're fabulous, I love your art and I want to feature it on this page that every month I feature, you know, art and an artist. Okay. Well, that's easy and that feels really good. But when I would move on, you know, people would come back and say, made me feel so good and easy and it was great for my business. But now I don't know how to find another Amy or how to pitch another Amy. Mm. Oftentimes they needed a third party. That editor did not want to hear directly from them that it wasn't cool for them to pitch for starters and that they would be bugging them. And one of the main points is that editors and writers are looking for new content all the time. Like you said, you've got 52 episodes. You've got to find good guests, solid guests, but you want to make it good. Same with these magazines, same with online publications, even more so. There are probably more places to be published at this point. It's so much in the homework, you know, not in the actual pitching, but sometimes people just get all, I pitched and now I'm just going to wait. But it's really the work is more in the homework to get it so close to where it's easy for that person to say yes. Make your art business legal with Autumn Boyd. The question I get asked a lot is, do I need an LLC? (laughs) Is that the one you hear the most too? What's the one that you hear? I hear that one. I hear, do I need to trademark my brand or my name? Yeah. yeah, Um, yeah. I hear, what do I do about copycats? A lot of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. All of those. Yes, yes. Yeah. Typically, if I'm working with a new client, like let's say you call me up and you're like, I don't know what I need. 
I don't usually start with an LLC or sole proprietorship or all those questions. I don't think it's the number one thing. And by the way, my answer to that, just so people know, it was years before I set up my LLC. Like I was sole proprietor from like the beginning. I didn't think it was a huge deal. I didn't get why I need an LLC. And then the story I shared with you that you know about, the reason I finally did set up an LLC is because my Instagram account got hacked. I'm trying to remember when this was. It was like a good five years ago. But I realized I didn't have a piece of paper that identified Shulman Art legally as my business. I had my tax documents had Miriam Shulman on it. They didn't say Shulman Art. So I really didn't have anything to go to Facebook or Instagram and say, yes, I own Shulman Art. Where attention goes, success flows with Justin Anthony. You are a small business. If you are an artist, you are a small business owner. You are an entrepreneur. The number of hats you have to wear is something so few people can understand. So in addition to having to birth these creative things on the world and put yourself out there creatively, you also have to be a marketer, an accountant. It's so easy to get daunted by all these business basics, and it's so easy to get overwhelmed with that. But the reality that we see is those artists that kind of embrace the fact that there is a business aspect to it are the ones that are making a living doing what they love. Even if you do find a gallery, unless you're being represented by Gagosian Gallery in New York, right. you're probably going to have to be in five galleries to make a living as an artist. And then you're going to have to make sure you know where all this artwork is. But even then, they're not doing your taxes for you. You know, before artists decide to go full time, you know, you've practiced your craft and your spare time to experiment, express yourself and grow. And, and you should always approach art. But when you decide to turn art into a career, you're going to begin to see your artwork as an asset in a business. And there's this big difference between art practice and art business. You know, it's the way to bring in money and support yourself and your future dreams. And artists often don't want to talk about money, but it's essential to be able to keep doing what you love. And it's a critical component of your art practice. Front Row Philosophy with Jen Lena. I literally have lived my life in the front row. I always go straight to the front and usually like front and center. And the reason is because you you actually, you just see everything better. You hear better. Your questions get answered faster. So then that translates really nicely into the metaphorical part of it, which is just like when you go to the front, you're all in, right? Like you can't make an exit for the door real quick. So metaphorically, like when you step up to the front row in life and in business, you're just saying like, here I am. I'm not afraid for the people behind me to see me. I'm not afraid for the people in front of me to see me raise my hand and I'm just going to get everything I can out of this. When you sit in the front row at a conference, the people on either side of you are going to be the most interesting people in that room because they are also like go-getters, you know, they're also have that attitude of like, I want to just soak it all up. I want to soak it all in. I'm here. I'm present. And they're the best people. So I'm telling you, I have had the most incredible collaborations in business and, and friendships that have formed right up there in the, in the front row. So, so now it's really like, you know, I will kill myself to get to the front row. Confidence Philosophy with Karen Donaldson. Here's the thing. When people think about confidence, Miriam, the first thing they say is, you know, I want to know how to feel more confident. What do I need to do to feel more confident? And what I tell people is you're going about it the wrong way. And if you continue to try to feel confident, you will never, ever succeed. That is not what I hear. What I hear from people, they will feel confident when they have successful event. So for my artists, that's like, they will feel confident after they sold art. And I'm always trying to tell them it's the other way around. So is that still in line with your philosophy? Or? Nope, not at all. Perfect oh, conversation. So let me awesome. just talk. Yes, let's talk, talk about this. What it's okay. about. Let's talk about it here. Uh, Here's awesome. the reality, whether people believe it or not, confidence is not an emotion. Happiness, oh. sadness, excitement is an emotion. Confidence is not an emotion. Huh. And that's the misconception people have. Here's what confidence actually is. It's a behavior yeah. and an attitude which we're always in control of. Oh. Confidence is actually a choice. And when I work with my clients and collectors around shifting their beliefs, that's when their life starts to shift. Over Deliver with Brian Katz. 
no matter how big your list is or no matter how small your list is, you can gain so much by learning a lot of this stuff, whether from me or someone else. But you have so much to offer in the world. And if you're not marketing yourselves and not using some of these techniques, you're missing out on not only people buying your stuff, but sharing your vision with the world. So that's, yeah. that's where I leave it. 100%. Because when I interview people from my incubator, there's two things that I hear. One, they want to make a living. If you want to make a living, you got to market. And the other thing I hear is their goal is they want to be famous or recognized. They want recognition. Well, you can't do that without marketing either. Right. So whatever your goal is, you need to know how to market. How to build an abundant mindset with Tara Newman. You need to be able to identify what it is that you want to receive. Okay. Right? Like, well, I want more or I want abundance or I want wealth or I want more money. Like, what does your more look like? Mm. And you have to be able to define it clearly. And so... In terms of receiving it, I like to also just write that out. I am open to receiving more income. I am open to receiving unexpected income. I'm open to receiving more time on my calendar because abundance isn't just about money. Sometimes the way we feel the most abundant and the way we feel the most rich has nothing to do with money. Yeah. And I just want to make this very specific for my creative and artists because sometimes they don't always make that leap themselves but I am open to receiving money for my art. I'm open to making more art sales. I have abundant time to create because a lot of times I see this more with my art students than the clients I coach to sell their art. They feel they don't have time to create because they're always putting everybody else's needs in front and they're so used to that behavior. So even when they have free time, they're still looking for what they can do for somebody Mm -hmm. else instead of looking at what they can do for themselves. Mm -hmm. Money Mindset Blocks with Kelly Hollingsworth. And if I found one, I could find another one because opportunities are like cockroaches where there's one, there's two, where there's two, there's four. I think this is such a powerful concept for your audience because as artists, we tend to think, well, one person liked my novel, one person liked my painting. But if there's one, there's two. If there's two, there's four. So you just have to know and trust and believe that there is more there. If one person loved it and if it resonated with one person, it will be true with lots and lots of people. In my work with women who want to make more money, One of the things we do is we look at the copy they write, whether it's an email to an investor, something to post on Facebook, an ad, a podcast episode, whatever it is, always looking for the under earning thoughts that generated those words. I can feel them in the words when I read the words. So I think that the words have a residue on them when they're written from an under earning place. I think it applies not to just the communication part of it, but actually in the creation part, there's an energy about yourself when you're creating that informs what you create. There's bravery, there's courage, you're doing things that other people won't do. And if you're not feeling that way about yourself when you're creating, you're holding back. So I think with art, especially whatever it is that you're hiding from because you're feeling unconfident, that will impair your art and it will impair the way you describe your art to others. People pleasing, perfectionism and procrastination with Sean Roney. It's worth kind of mentioning, especially since you have an artist community and artists that listen, inspiration is probably a feeling that is really productive and serves you really well because anytime you're feeling inspired, your actions are going to be create more work share my work. So that might be just worth tucking away. Mm. Inspired might be a feeling that's really helpful for this community. And so when you feel inspired, you do all these things. And then the result you're creating is you've sold more art during the pandemic. I like to think of feelings as kind of being in my closet that I can choose, deliberately choose a feeling. Like if I want to feel confident, I can deliberately choose that for myself. You can do that. You can practice feeling on purpose. So if there's a feeling that feels less familiar, but you think it might be helpful, you can actually remember back to a time when you experienced that feeling and just really, really remember what it felt like in your body, where you felt it, how it felt, and practice feeling that feeling on purpose. It's like strengthening a muscle, right? Mm. You can practice it on purpose. So 
goes with what you just said. You can choose any feeling that feels like it would be helpful and then practice the skill of like calling it in, thinking a thought when you need it. So first of all, can you just define what people pleasing is? Yeah, it's basically showing up in a way that you think you can heavily influence what someone else thinks about you. So it's like doing things oftentimes that you don't want to do for the sheer purpose of either being afraid of what someone might think of you or if you don't do something, fearing what someone might think of you. So you're really basically taking action and living life from a place of worrying about others' thoughts. And what I like to teach is honestly, other people's opinions of you really are none of your business. Like it's a nice space, but everyone's allowed to have their own thoughts. And so spending the energy really trying to anticipate what someone else might think is impossible, first of all, because people bring their thoughts, their own perspective, their life experience. So a lot of the time you're just going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. The other thing with that is, are you actually being authentically you? The person, like, let's say you show up a certain way, the way you think someone wants you to, and they like it. It doesn't feel great anyways if it's not what you would do normally, who you would normally be. The person that they're liking isn't really you when you're people pleasing. It can lead to feeling resentful. Your heroic character with Ron Reich. The other important things to map out, there are your quirks. We mentioned that a little bit. So really, this is like, those are the things, again, that make you more of a a multidimensional person. So what I would consider, what are like one or two things about you that have nothing to do with your expertise or you being an artist, but just are interesting that people are going to relate to. So kind of quick, kind of shortcuts, kind of hacks for this are things like some anything you're obsessed with, for example. Like if there's like a food you're obsessed with, for example, or if there's like a, yeah, like a TV show you're obsessed with, like you mentioned The Real Housewives, that's something, for example. Pets are really, really good. Like I have my dog, Trevor. Hobbies are really good. If you have a certain hobby that you're kind of known for, Basically, think about those kind of things. What I would encourage you to do is have like one or two of them as your kind of like your main quirks that you kind of want people to know about you. So like recurring themes. Exactly. Yes. Like in my case, I'm known for like my dog. I have a lot of pictures of me me and my dog. I'm also really into like a hobby. I do fitness and I do a lot of half marathons, kind of into that kind of stuff. And on the opposite, which is also kind of interesting, I'm also really into Nutella. So I'm like obsessed with Nutella. I'm addicted to Nutella. So those are kind of like the three kind of main things that I'll kind of... It's a good thing you're addicted to fitness too. (laughs) Exactly. So yeah, we've got a little bit of a juxtaposition there, which which is, you know, all those things are good. That's more interesting. It's cool. It's more interesting that I'm a fitness dude who's into Nutella. Balancing creative practice with running a business with Jennifer Rosenfeld. A lot of the most satisfying creative work that many of us would love to do does not make money, or it doesn't make money right now, or it doesn't make enough money. For so many musicians who are requiring all of their money to come from a very limited list of activities, they get themselves in a situation where they don't have the time or energy or brain space to work on those really important creative projects that are not money making right now. They're realizing that their financial situation, even if it's stable and okay, it's actually not enough to support the life they want and the family that they have. And or they're realizing that they're working way too much. They're just drained and it could actually become a health hazard if they don't start working less. And yet they feel like I can't work less because how much I work now is tied to my income and I can't lower my income. So it's sort of this like challenging cycle where there isn't enough time and there isn't enough money to sort of reset everything. The first step that I'm working on with a client is how do we restructure your life so that you can be making more money using your expertise, using skills that you feel like you have to offer as a gift to the world, but doing it in a way that's way more profitable than anything you've done before so that you can start to win back your time and start turning down the gigs that you wouldn't take anymore. The world needs your art with Elise Dama. I truly believe you can make money from Instagram with less than a thousand followers. I always tell my students, don't get caught up in trying to be Insta famous. There are many people with hundreds of thousands of followers making zero dollars. And majority of my case studies and my best students monetized five figures-ish around that area with 
under a thousand followers. So you can have that success even as an artist. And you mentioned, you know, the comparison trap, especially on Instagram, that is dangerous. I would really recommend for you to not allow yourself to go down that black hole. Truth be told, I barely look at my newsfeed. I just go in, I post, I post my stories, I check my DMs. That's pretty much it. And I recommend for you to get focused with the time that you're spending on Instagram, especially if you're getting sucked into the comparison trap. Your story sells your art with Laura Belgray. Here's what I hear from people. And I have my ideas. And I'm talking about like my clients who I coach who want to sell their art. They say they hate writing emails because they feel like they're talking to their computers. So what advice do you have specifically for those artists? Yeah, I think that you want to picture a person who is your ideal collector. It's probably a friend, especially if you've claimed that only your friends collect your art and a friend who maybe is such a fan of yours, such a fan of your art that they always want first dibs, Mm. anything that you put out there and are furious if you've sold it to somebody else without telling them about it. Think of that person that you love so much that you feel comfortable around who just loves everything that you do. If you need to, you can open an email from your regular, like your regular email client on your desktop, wherever you compose an email, right? So I use Mac mail. So I open up a Mac email if I'm having trouble, if I'm having trouble picturing that one person. And I start an email to them, but truly to them. Like what would I write to this person? In what language? So I don't start to make it newsletter-y, I don't have a big intro. You know, if it were you, Miriam, I would just say like, you know, what's shaken if I'm writing about art? Just finish this piece. I know you're going to want to see because you were so mad at me last time when I didn't tell you about it. It is, if I do say so, pretty spectacular. Do you want to come see it? You know, I just like put it in the words that I would use with a person that I like and know. And then maybe you dress it up. Then maybe you, you know, put more into it. But when you start it off in the right tone, with the right person in your mind's eye, it's going to be a lot easier. Don't stay quiet with Amy Porterfield. I love Facebook and Instagram and all of the social media channels. But when you put your business on social media channels, you are literally putting your business out there on rented land. We do not own Instagram. We do not own Facebook. The algorithms could change overnight, which means tomorrow morning when you wake up, your message might not get to nearly as many people or half the people or so much less than you would have thought if the algorithm changed. You're getting to so many fewer people. You can't control that. And believe me, it has happened many times. We literally went to bed one night, woke up the next morning, and Facebook tells us that all organic traffic is going to slow down considerably and you've got to pay to be seen. And we've only seen it happen more and more. Use social, but also have an email list, you own that email list. That is yours and it will become your most important asset in your business. When you treat them as friends, family, and people you genuinely care about, that no like and trust factor will increase. They'll feel the same about you. And when you make an offer, I can promise you, your email list will become so much more profitable than any offer you make on social media. I want you to use both, but just know you can rely on that email list so much more than you will ever be able to do so on social. Color code with Tarzan K. That doesn't work. When people join your email list, they are actively saying, yes, I would like to hear from you. So when you collect these email addresses and then they don't hear from you, it sends the message that you are not consistent and you are not a serious business person. Mm. You got to reframe that. Like rather than like, what's going to happen if I email my list? Like, oh my God, what's going to happen if you don't? That's actually a lot worse. So They do want to hear from you. And there are plenty of studies to show that people do want to get emails from their favorite brands at least once a week. Like there's plenty of stats behind it. Let's examine like your own feelings about email marketing. Like, do you hate the emails in your inbox? Probably you don't hate all of them. Some of them you probably don't like. So take note of why you don't like those. And you're not going to send emails with the big flashing button at the top that says 10% off. And the other ones that you really do like that you enjoy from week to week and get excited about when they land in your inbox, like what's going on there? Maybe you could be that person. 
maybe you could be that bright spot in someone else's inbox that they're like, oh, oh my gosh, a new email from Miriam. I wonder what this is. No flowery words required with Danielle Weil. So let's start off with that limiting self-belief, Danielle, about writing flowery language. And do you know what they're talking about when they say that? You know, I have to make something that is super compelling and super hypey and sounds like the best thing in the world and go on and on. It has to be perfect. Mm. It has to sound amazing. I think that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. You know what? I never asked them what they mean by that, but I've heard it several times, that exact phrase. I think they meant like, you know, sugary when they talk about the art that has all these extra adjectives and words, maybe. Well, because extra adjectives and saying, you know, all the superlatives, this is the best. That's actually the opposite of what you want to do in copy. And my approach to writing is kind of clean, elegant, straightforward. My background is in creative writing. So every word that you're writing should be there for a reason. So you don't have to put in lots of extra words that don't need to be there. The other cool thing about writing to sell, whether it's more of your art or courses, is that simple language works. But there's got to be some happy medium between the belief that I have to write flowery language and then the belief that I just have to put the name of the course and a price. So absolutely. (laughs) There's somewhere in between. There is somewhere in between. Why Selling Art is All About Your Energy with Susie Ashworth. Seeing yourself as the successful artist and the person that you want to be and writing that down, like really just imagining yourself in your most expansive self, you know, standing and presenting at your art show or being invited to exhibit somewhere. Like, think about your most expansive self and think about how that feels. Get into the feeling of what it would be like. The biggest thing when it comes to charging what you want to charge for the, whatever it is you're selling is, first of all, giving yourself permission to want what you want when you want it and then receive what you want to receive when you want to receive it and that permission piece is so important I think that one of the biggest things that holds women back in business in general is we still we revert back into the child archetype a lot so it's funny because we spend a lot of time mothering and being maternal in whatever way shape or form but when it comes to our business it's like am I allowed to do this is it okay if I can do that which is very much being in the child archetype and so I want you to really really step into it's safe for me to charge what I want and I don't have to ask anybody else's permission I get to give myself permission because I'm the grown-up and this is my business and I'm the boss the four tendencies with Gretchen Rubin which tendency is the happiest that's a really important question and what I found is that it isn't that one tendency is the happiest or the most productive or the most creative or the most successful What you see is that the people who are the happiest and the most productive, et cetera, are the people who have really figured out themselves and they understand their strengths and they also understand their weaknesses and their limitations. And they've constructed an environment and circumstances that allow them to do their best work. So obligers who have figured out how to give themselves the outer accountability they need to follow through on their aims for themselves do great. Rebels who have figured out, well, you know what? I don't do well with somebody looking over my shoulder. I don't do well with deadlines. I don't like to be supervised. I like to have a lot of freedom and choice and spontaneity. Let me get myself to a place where that works for me. Well, then they do very well. Questioners who are in an environment where their questioning is really valued and rewarded do extremely well. If a questioner gets to a place where it's like, hey, we're all here as a team. We have a visionary leader and we are here to execute on that vision. It's like, well, but I don't understand why this is being done. And just because we did this this way last year doesn't mean we should do it this way this year. And like, I don't understand why corporate is telling us to use the software because it just seems dumb. That might not be a good place for the questioner. So it's really about figuring out a fit. Healing trauma through visual journaling with Amber Walker. People will say, I don't know if that's really a trauma or not. 
And really the only definition that I use in my practice is, does it divide a time before and after? So can you go back and say, I was this person before and I was this person after? Was it a real defining event for you that changed you? And so a car accident for some people come into the practice to work on for trauma, abuse, combat. So it is a very loose definition. It's something that's impacted you and now is impacting your life in a negative way. How to be an anti-racist artist with Erica Corday. I saw this post the other day an artist who I admire very much, Alyssa Burke. So she was talking about something that I've experienced myself as well as an artist who posts pretty pictures. We get a lot of pushback from our followers when we post anything that they deem as political, which we may not even see as political. And I wanted to make sure we brought this up early on because the question is, why are we even talking about this on an art podcast? And it matters... Mm -hmm a lot why we're talking about this. Oh, I wish they could see your face. <laughs> <laughs> That's my whole thing. You see me in person. I'm like, I can't fix my face and I have no intentions on doing so. The minute something is perfectly curated, I call bullshit because I don't think that that's accurate. First of all, I think the curation, it's you trying to placate this image that everybody told you you had to have. So I already don't care for that particular part. But I don't like the fact that you are now saying if you don't show up in this specific way, in this specific tone, with this specific set of images, that you are invalidated, which to me also speaks about your invalidation as a human. And I'm like, no, that's BS. Let's not do that. But this is also someone else passing judgment on something. And I feel like art is a very layered and personal thing. You can be progressive and spiritual with Whitney McNeil. I'm going to be open about who I am. And if I feel I need to quiet that voice to make them feel comfortable, that's the problem for me. I had given some shade to after the vice presidential debate. I had posted a watercolor painting of a house fly. Did I tell you the story, Whitney? <laughs> no. Oh, my God, that caused a shit storm over on my Facebook page. I've never had a post go viral, organically go viral. This one kind of did. It was like hundreds of shares, hundreds of comments, people announcing how they're unfollowing me, unsubscribing. They're never doing business with me again. How dare I express myself? Mm. That's where I have the problem. Artists should express themselves, yes. all parts of themselves, not yes. just the parts that make you feel comfortable. So that's where I say, like, if I make you feel uncomfortable, you can leave. 100%. Yeah. Vice versa, right? And then if you're feeling uncomfortable, then, then, then you can we leave. have to leave. Yeah. You're going to be okay with Susie Moore. That's why when I interview people for my artist incubator program. So in addition to teaching art techniques, you heard about my little commercial at the beginning about teaching people how to paint. I also coach artists how to sell their art. And one of the questions I have on there that's very telling on a scale to one to 10, how committed you are. Mm. And really, you need to be a 10. I will talk to somebody if they're not a 10 because it's arbitrary sometimes what they think a nine or a 10 is. But you're filling out an application. If you're a seven, yeah. it's probably not going to work out for you because you really have to be committed. Oh, Miriam, I teach the same thing. In fact, if someone comes to me and they are full of enthusiasm and I just know that even if they uh, reject it, they'll just get up. I'm like, you are a success story already. It's yeah. just a matter of time before yeah. that's revealed. But if someone's really brilliantly talented, but unsure doubting, doesn't know, doesn't feel safe, then I'm like, I probably can't help you. I can only help you if you're willing to help you. <laughs> right. You know, and then we can really go places. Like we can like go far. But if you're like, mm, yeah, I don't know, then that questioning, it's exhausting. You're in this constant place of fatigue and second guessing. It doesn't work out so well. If you observe it in anybody else, it's hard to see it ourselves sometimes, but it's very easy to observe in other people. Like just that resilience and commitment. I swear it's like, it's truly like the only thing. I work with so many people. They're on the cusp of something, but something goes wrong. They get derailed by a mean comment or some negative family feedback. They see somebody else and they think I can never catch up. And so they just park their car. It's like, well, that, yeah, tried that. Right. What do you mean you're parking your car? Like we're about to take off. I didn't really appreciate patience 
you know, until like the last couple of years, like what really does compound over time that nothing can really replace it. There is so much that goes into what makes a person successful. It does take time. It does require patience and that's okay. We think, well, this is it. So long as you're alive and you have desires and you're capable of doing things, if there's breath, there's more. Visibility and vulnerability with India Jackson. When we think of branding, we think of it as your public image, your reputation. It's what someone is going to say about you when you're not around to influence, you know, what's being said or sometimes, you know, alter what they say because they know you're right there. It's what they would say to someone else if they describe who you are as an artist or who you are as a person. And sometimes it can be both. And so being clear about that then determines that, oh, well, if we look at brand in this way, then everything else that we're doing shapes that. The colors, the logo, the type of art that you create, how you dress, what your photographs look like, what your captions are about, what subjects do you cover when you are connecting with your people. These are all shaping what would be said about you, but they're not necessarily the brand on our own. The power of daily practice with Eric Meisel. It was very heavy for me to think about, I have to go work on my art. And when I started changing my language and both in my thoughts and what I was saying to my family, I would just say to them, hey, I'm going upstairs to splash around some paint. And they would laugh. And that's not exactly what I'm doing up there, but bringing kind of that mental attitude to my studio has really helped me. And you wrote so beautifully about the idea of playfulness. So I'd like if you could share a little more on that. Playfulness quite pointedly follows solemnity in in that list of practices because it's there's a dance here. Many, Many of these ideas are duets, devotion and discipline, one thing and another. And here I think you don't want to be as an artist only playful because then you're not being serious enough in some sense, but you also can't just be serious because then you're really not allowing enough of your imagination in, enough freedom in. Most artists think they need more discipline or that they're not disciplined enough. And in fact, it's more devotion that they need. They need to find the source of passion and love and enthusiasm and interest and curiosity. They're all synonyms for a place we come from when we do the work. And I think it's a loving place. Pavarotti had a quote I, I've always liked, which is people say I'm disciplined and it's not discipline, it's devotion, and there's a big difference. I think artists are extra disappointed right now. That's my experience mm. of what's going on. They're disappointed in, in the world, of course, but they're disappointed in themselves because they have, so to speak, more free time. They're getting less work done. And that's disappointing. I think they're not crediting the difficulty of the situation enough. It's hard to get three billion neurons in a row all gathered together for the sake of writing your novel when so many hundreds of millions of those neurons are thinking about other things. So this is really a special time to do personal cognitive work, to try to think thoughts that serve you, to try to shut out as much of what you don't need to be knowing as possible. It's really not valuable to have news that you can't act on. That's just noise. Poverty Mindset with Erica Corday. What you believe becomes true for you because you're always going to look for evidence of why that's true. Right. And so to be able to get to a point to understand that the way that you were conditioned to view or to think about yourself is not based on your own sense of worth. It's based on somebody else's lack of self-worth or their need for you to be lesser than in order to validate their self-worth. And so you don't know that this isn't yours. Like it really takes some effort to get out of that, to realize that this isn't how I feel about myself. This is what I was told I was supposed to feel about myself, but it's not true. And to be able to live in a world and attempt to reconcile with yourself that you do feel differently, even though the world doesn't reflect that, which is where I think that the poverty mindset can be very almost painful because you're trying to change your own thought process, but the world is like, nope. No, no, we don't do that. This is what this is. And you're supposed to stay here. You're not supposed to do this. And there's so many things that fight against you when you try to. Your role as an artist with Heather Alice Shea. Back in the day when they wanted to really punish a person, they did not kill you. They banished you. They kicked you out. That was worse. 
And so now when we're rejected, the reason why it's so painful is because it's almost like we're experiencing that again, like on a psychological level, it's as if that's happening. So, you know, the first thing is to just show yourself compassion. There's a reason why it hurts so bad. And it's a real valid reason. But we also have to look at it for what it is and say, look, if other people do not approve of my artwork, if they do not think that it's worth the price I've put on it, that is not an indictment on my personal value. You know, I charge way more than your average life coach. And I, I told her my rate and she goes, well, that's way more than I thought that I you know, would ever pay, but you're worth it. My response to her shocked me. I said, I'm going to stop you right there. Mm. I am not worth $500 an hour. I am priceless. I will let you pay me 500. Whoa. And it was like this energy arose in me. And I'm like, I, me, I'm priceless. Now my services, what I create in the world, okay, we put a price tag on it. We try to come up with what we think is fair and what feels good. But I think that self-doubt, it comes from not feeling really secure in like, wait, I'm priceless. I'm valuable. Oh my gosh, that was so much fun. Now, don't forget, we've included links to all the full episodes featured in today's best of in the show notes. Go find that over at shulmanart.com forward slash 121. Now, don't forget also to check out this week's curation of freebies. Head on over to shulmanart.com forward slash freebies. You'll find my favorite art supply list for passionistas, the artist profit plan ebook for my passion professionals, and then something a little extra for all my art lovers out there. All right, passion makers, thank you so much for being with me here today. I'll see you the same time, same place next week. Have a happy new year. Thank you for listening to the Inspiration Place podcast. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shulmanart, on Instagram at shulmanart, and of course, on shulmanart.com. 